Hello, and welcome to this first lecture video for chapter 9, which is about the behavior of fluids. Now, we are in a new unit, as the book breaks it up, which is fluids and heat. What do those two things have to do with each other? Well, they have to do a lot with each other because they're all about the statistically analyzed motion of trillions upon trillions, trillions of trillions, of individual particles, all behaving together collectively. Because that's what we analyze, that's what we seek to quantify when we talk about heat flow, which we'll do starting in chapter 10. And when we talk about fluid motion, especially the motion, that's what we're talking about as well. Uh, we're actually going to start off this, this uh, chapter here, if you look at the slides, by talking about, there's some fluid motion with the ship, but talking about fluids at rest, really this concept of just pushing and being able to push in all directions, it's not so important to consider all of those individual particles in that case because all you really need to think about in the case of a fluid is almost like a domino effect that the force is delivered from one freely moving particle to another okay um, and of course in that process if you might be wondering I'm going to define what a fluid is because should I be saying liquid should I be saying gas no but we'll get right back to that because I just want to finish making this point about fluids and heat coming together because where are we finishing from right we're finishing from a discussion of mechanics where we looked at individual things which we usually call a ball or a block but it could have been some, some tiny subatomic sub particle just one thing and there was a certain number of forces on that free body that thing that could move well could we do that with a fluid could we do that with the ocean right with a large body of water well even in a few grams of water there are a trillion trillion individual atoms right that then could be tracked and moved by the forces acting on that individual atom could we then track every single atom could we scale up our calculations could we run it with a computer well the issue if, is if we want to run a suitably complex model that deals with all the possible interactions that one individual, in, one individual particle could experience, one atom in this entire sea of atoms, right, um, on the order of 10, 10 to the 40, um, comparably, 10 to the, I mean, if we're talking about 10 to the 24 in terms of, you know, in just a few grams, orders of grams, so maybe 10 to the 34, 10 to the 33 atoms and a huge body of water like, a, like an Earth's ocean. That estimate aside, that's 33 zeros by the way, all those individual atoms moving, they're going to interact with their immediate neighbors, there's going to be a ton of forces on them. Could something like this be calculated? Well, could you build a computer to actually make that calculation? Right? Could you calculate an entire cloud of gas that's the, si that's the size of a galaxy, a protogalactic protogalactic gas cloud and all the individual atoms that are behaving and swirling together in that? Could you model that behavior from, the, from an individual atom perspective? Well, wouldn't you have to build the computer from the, the, you know, from the same system, the universe, that you're trying to model the universe from? How, how big are we going to scale it up? So you, there's no way, it's impossible, theoretically, philosophically, to actually calculate from an individual particle perspective the entire universe because you'd have to use the universe to make that calculation, a universe that's finite in size, right? So it's inherently too complex. We can't apply individual classical mechanics, Newtonian mechanics, to systems that involve trillions upon trillions of particles, okay? So what do we do then? We take an approach where we look at their behavior in mass, their behavior collectively. We, we develop important rules that describe that behavior, rules that people had to notice in the way of a law, make an a observation that holds true, a universal observation, understand the underlying mechaniz mechanisms of it, look for related um, concepts. That's, that seems to be the building blocks of what we see with the laws of fluids, the laws of heat. Okay, heat flow, fluid flow, whatever it may be. Okay, so definitely that's the idea. That's how we came from mechanics. That's what we're going to now talking about millions, billions, trillions of individual things all bumping around and moving together. Okay, but we don't track each one, not anymore. Okay, so we get into this subfield of physics, the discussion of fluids first, which is just chapter nine, then we'll spend two chapters on heat. Um, there's, there's, there's a bit more going on there. There's more attention um, given to heat, understandably so. But fluids is a packed full chapter um, because it, gets, it just gets the one, but there are quite a few concepts. Uh, we'll need to talk about pressure, which is one of the um, fluids at rest questions. 
but we don't stay at rest forever, uh, although we do spend most of the time there owing to the complexity of fluids in motion because we will talk about this idea of pressure, we'll talk about a fluid lever, so that's coming down here to Pascal's principle. Um, it, it's called Pascal's principle, it's also called hydraulics, but it's a lever. It's the same concept as a lever. If you recall um, me talking about a lever in an earlier video, also covered in the chapter um, on you know, simple machines and work. Okay, there it is, there's our, our lever system. All right, um, which is one of the, the go-to types of calculations in terms of, um, of straightforward uh, algebraic problems that you can be assigned. Anyone rec recognize this? This is an a, um, old-fashioned barometer, okay, um, with a, um, a mercury pool. It's actually open to the air, there might, there, um, which is a bit of a problem because it actually does slowly evaporate mercury. It just, you know, some, some particular ones uh, can jump up into the air and become airborne. Um, but regardless, uh, here's the idea of atmospheric pressure um, decreasing as you increase in altitude. So if you go up a mountain, um, some of you might notice, um, I wasn't saying an airplane, maybe you're in a pressurized cabin in an airplane, but you, some of you might notice in a car, if you drive up a significant elevation, so you know, many thousands of feet, you'll notice that there's a, there's a big change in pressure. Okay, the, air, the car's not airtight, it's not pressurized like the cabin of an airplane, and so you notice it even if the windows are closed and it makes your ears pop, it makes your um, bags of chips. Um, well, depending on if you're going up or down, if you're, um, if you're going um, higher elevation, it makes your bags of chips expand and expand um, because there's less pushing on them, um, assuming that, you know, that they were packaged, which are usually gonna be you know, at kind of like close to sea level, all right? There's kind of an assumption there. All right, um, the idea about where atmospheric pressure comes from, it is a force that's pushing down on us all the time. Um, I always have fun asking um, my students to calculate how much force there is due to atmospheric pressure because we have a number for, for atmospheric pressure. It's 101,000 pascals, okay? A pascal is the standard unit of pressure. It's just a force per square meter. So you can see right from those standard units. It's a metric system, okay? Um, unit, the pascal. But you could also just call it the Newton per square meter. But everyone calls um, pressure pascals. There's other ways to measure pressure that are quite common, but we'll, use, we'll, use, we'll primarily use pascals. So you got 101,000 of those, those pressure units, at, you know, at sea level on average. It's going to vary because of storms. It's going to vary because of your elevation it's a lot, right? It's also going to vary because of particulates in the air slightly. Okay. So then. What does that mean, right, for a force? Because pressure is a force per area. Well, you, you can multiply by an area and you get yourself back to force. Okay? You multiply pressure by area and you get back to force. I have a few equations that I'll be talking about, and that's one of them. That's right there. Okay? Pressure is force over area. So if I solve for F force, then what I'm going to get is I'm going to get that F, multiplying both sides by A, is just going to be F equals PA. All right? It is simple as that. Multiply both sides by the cross-sectional area in square meters, and we get that force caused by some known value of pressure is just pressure times the area. So if we have an atmospheric pressure of 101,000, okay, magic number, you know, just in the, sen in the sense that it's a very common number, it comes up a lot, multiplied by, say, a square meter, or how about half a square meter, right? So kind of like your surface area on the upper part of your body, because this is like a force pushing on you, um, you could have a smaller number and say, oh, a cross-sectional area, my head, top of my head, my shoulders is um, a tenth of a square meter, right? Well, if you have a, you know, the, the unit's already in square meters, you got a tenth of a square meter, well, that's 101,000, well, times, you know, times 0.1, right? Um, then, you know, what do you get, right? Well, you're going to get that, you get 10,000, 10,000 newtons on that, you know, that 0.1 square meter. In fact, you know, you have, if you have 101,000, so 101,000 pascals, atmospheric pressure, all right here, atmospheric pressure, column of air pushing down on you. We live at the bottom of a sea of air, okay? We call it the atmosphere. We talk about it being thin and being composed of all these gases, but it is 100 kilometers tall, all right, give or take. So then if you think of the force then from the atmosphere, and we'll call this um, P ATM, right? So the force from the atmosphere um, on one square meter would just be that 101,000, okay? Remember Pascal's, as I was just saying, are Newtons per square meter multiplied by one square meter, right? The meters, the meters cancel, so we get 101,000 
newtons per square meter. So that's how much force the atmosphere delivers to everything. So it really is like being at the bottom of the ocean because when people talk about the bottom of the ocean, they talk about the crushing pressure of the ocean and how it will crush submarines. It will, you know, people can't go down there obviously because there, there's no way you could build a um, scuba suit or something that would protect you from that pressure. Um, so there's very, you know, heavily reinforced small submarines that can go down to the deepest parts of the ocean, which are many kilometers deep. Um, I believe over eight kilometers deep. Um, and so animals live down there. They've <clears throat> evolved to live in that pressure um, due to just their you know, particular you know, structure, due to um, it, themselves being pressurized, actually pushing back out against it. So you know, evolving a pressurized um, anatomy. So, so have we, all right? We live in significant forces, right? If we think about that 101,000 pascals, that's a huge deal, right? That, that's a huge amount of force. The maximum pushing force that someone can exert, an adult can exert, um, is going to vary, but it's going to be, let's say, on some rough average is 600 newtons, right? So 600, okay? Less than 1,000, half of 1,000 is a big, strong push, okay, from a human. So wait, right? This is 100,000, right? So this is, like, this is like being rolled over by a, you know, a 747, or this is like, you know, this is like a building falling on something, right? This is a huge amount of force, okay? Maybe a small building, right? But this is, this is a lot of force. This is like a, a tidal wave or, you know, at least a big ocean wave of like pushing force, you know, that could just pull something along, a rushing river. So you get the idea. Uh, regardless, that's just what we experience all the time, right? It doesn't crush us though, right? Because we've evolved to live in that condition. We live in this highly pressurized environment. Um, if you took a human and you threw them out into the vacuum of space, um, other than suffocating, um, potentially burning if they're in direct line with the sun, um, so just like quickly burning on the surface, um, and simultaneously freezing um, in terms of losing all of your internal heat. So you can like be burning on the surface while losing your internal heat, uh, which is just you know completely just radiating away from you. Um, so all of that happening together. One other thing is you would triple in volume. I don't know why I'm saying you. This is maybe just a person, right? Maybe this is a sci-fi movie and it's the villain. So they, they had it coming. So that, that person that got thrown out into space with no spacesuit, no pressurized environment, um, coming from you know, some simulation of Earth where we're under a normal amount of pressure of 101,000 pascals, which you could simulate in a chamber, right? Well, you throw that person out into a vacuum, like I said, they would triple in volume, okay? Somewhere between double and triple in volume. Um, so they would swell up. Um, it would, wouldn't kill them immediately based on um, some reports I've read, um, more speculative. <laughs> you know, it's interesting science. Um, so there you go. We, we live in a highly pressurized environment, something you take for granted and don't think about very often. Okay, so let's take a look at the first of the slides. Moving on. Okay, so we already talked about that. There's two main chunks of this, um, this chapter. Um, in this, this first video, um, tangents aside, talking about um, humans in space, <laughs> we're going to get up to um, Archimedes' principle, actually no, um, I'm just going to cover 9.1 and 9.2. So pressure and Pascal's principle and then atmospheric pressure and the behavior of um, gases. So um, particularly something called Boyle's Law. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what we're going to um, be seeing. So you actually see here, um, this, this should be uh, 9.2, right? Yep. And the behavior of gases. So there's some good slides on Boyle's Law. I'm trying to find it here in the, uh, t the actual textbook. There it is. All right. A little small to see, but P1, V1 equals P2, V2. That is one of the equations that we're going to have. Um, kind of striking similarity between uh, Pascal's principle and Boyle's law um, in, their, in terms of their mathematical form, but they're both simple equations. That's kind of why. They're, they were called a, a straightforward linear relationship. The product of two things remains constant. Okay? It's a you know, conservation of their product or just linear relationship. All right. So pressure and Pascal's principle. We should get some definitions out of the way. I told, already told, told you about the units of pressure. I, that's a great way to start. But let's make sure we're, we're good on some other understanding. Okay, so, um, so it says here, why does a small woman wearing high heel shoes sink into soft ground more than a large man wearing large shoes, right? So clearly um, this, you know, these um, impractical shoes um, that you know, due to gender norms this woman has you know, decided to wear, um, are sinking, right? They're sinking down to the ground because of their smaller cross-sectional area. So despite her smaller weight, that 
that that fact, you know, that like maybe advantage for not sinking is more than compensated for by the small area, right? So because what do you have? You have force equals pressure, you know, pressure per area, right? Or rather you have, no, I said the backwards pressure times area, right? So if you have a small area, right? Then you're going to, and you have the same, you know, it, you know, the pressure will go up is what I'm trying to say. Here, let me go back to the equations. Excuse me for fumbling over that a bit, All right? So if we go over here, we have that the pressure is force per area, okay? So what I'm saying is that, yes, her force, which is her weight, is a bit smaller, but that area value, the, the cross-sectional area of her shoes compared to a normal flat pair of shoes, well, then you're gonna end up with a case where that area is much smaller, you're dividing by a much smaller number, okay? So then your pressure has gone way up. So let's, let's consider a couple, uh, just a couple of cases, okay? So we're gonna call this the pressure for flat shoes, and then we're going to have the pressure for um, high heels. And in the case of the flat shoes, we have, if we're sticking with a larger person wearing them, um, then we'll have, say, a 100 kilogram person, and you multiply by a rough estimate of 10 meters per second squared for gravitational acceleration, 100 times 10 is 1,000. So I'm gonna put in 1,000 newtons for the weight of the person, gravitational force of the person, that's the F, okay? I'm gonna divide by their cross-sectional area of their shoes, which we're gonna say is gonna be um, 18 centimeters um, by, well, more like, um, yeah, so 18 centimeters, by um, nine centimeters. So 18 times nine, we'll put that down here. So 18 times nine um, square centimeters. Um, so if we wanna convert over, probably wanna put those right in meters. So we don't even have to, otherwise we have to have, um, it just have one over 10 squared. Um, so it's a difference of uh, 10 squared, 100. Yeah, um, but we'll just put it right in meters. All right, so saying 0.18 meters, all right, and then times 0 0.09 meters, okay? Meanwhile, lighter person, let's say that their weight is 700 newtons, because they have a mass of 70 kilograms, and then they have those much smaller shoes though, so we should have a dramatic difference here in the area. Let's just say it's, um, you know, four, you know, four, right? So four times one, so 0 0.04 um, centimeters, so four centimeter by one centimeter total cross-sectional area. All right, zero, one meters, right? So much, much smaller shoes. What are the values we would get in that case? Well, let's run the numbers. So, thousand, all right, and then divided by 0.18 times 0 0.09, okay? And I need my multiplication in there. All right, looks good. So we have a pressure in the case of the flat shoes of 61,000, right? So we'll just round the 62,000 because the next number was a seven. And this is after all an estimate, 62,000, what are the units here? Pascals, okay? So that's the pressure that, that the shoes are delivering onto the ground. That's the force per area. So when you think about pressure being delivered onto a surface, um, it's, you might be like, wait, don't we want to get back to force? Because we usually think about you know, force acting on, our, on something, causing acceleration. But pressure is a great way to think about things that have the potential of, like the ground, kind of behaving like a fluid, right? The ground can push out of the way. That's a very fluid-like behavior, okay? Mud is, you know, right? Or turning, turning dirt, in, dirt into a mud, right? Um, landslides kind of start behaving like a fluid. They go from you know, one, one behavior to another. So and even in the case of a solid, you might, go on, you might care about you know, the spread of that force because that's what we're measuring, force per area. So when we get this value, this is, this is what we'll look at for deciding whether the ground can hold it because the ground has a certain pressure threshold. And the idea here is if we look at the lighter woman but with the much smaller cross-sectional area on her shoes, all right, so we had so 1,000 and then we have the 700, not 7,000. And then 0 0.04 times 0 0.01. So we end up with 7 million, all right? And look, yeah, I'm looking at that correctly. Instead of 61,000, 7 million Pascals. Okay, so 7 Pascals. Okay, 
So yeah, we went from, from under 100,000 all the way up to 7 million pascals, huge increase. Oh, excuse me. Huge increase in the amount. Right. And I don't, nothing was cut off before, but it's kind of awkward. There we go. So you can see it. There we go. There's all of the calculations. The, two, the comparison we just did was this one um, right over here. The pressure delivered by two different pairs of shoes for two different weight people. Okay. So if you need to have a certain amount of force and you want to not break something, you want to spread that force out, okay? So that's why someone can lay on a bed of nails, which is a you know, often common demonstration of this idea, how, what, what really is pressure, right? In that case, it's like countable nails, but the demonstration still works. So the man weighs more, so he exerts a larger force on the ground. The woman weighs less, but the force she exerts on the ground is spread over a much smaller area. Pressure takes into account both force and the area over which the force is applied. Why? Because some things have pressure thresholds. Certainly fluids, right? Fluids are more responsive to pressure than force. Because individual forces, what does that mean for a fluid? It just means you deform the fluid, right? It's the pressure that matters. So pressure is the ratio of the force to area over which it is, which it is applied, okay? So it is one Newton per square meter. The unit, the Pascal, uppercase P, right? Pascal, named after a scientist, okay? Famous for research in um, fluids, okay? P equals F over A, here are the variables, F for force, A for area, cross-sectional area measured in square meters, P for pressure, okay? So pressure not force is the quantity that determines whether the, so the soil will yield. Excellent, okay. So Pascal's principle as promised, okay? So Pascal's principle is a machine principle. It's just like the lever. It's the idea of putting a small force in and getting a big force out. It's a force multiplier, okay? All right, the lever did that because of the lengths of the lever arms. A hydraulic system obeying Pas Pascal's principle will do it because of the different areas of the input piston and the output piston. So if you can push on a little input, but your output is large, then you've multiplied your force, okay? Because the pressure is conserved, delivered universally within that entire chamber of closed fluid, and because of that, that means that you have a small force in because you have a small area, but that then allows you to put a big force out for the big area, okay? Because it's the pressure that's concerned, um, conserved. Remember, pressure is the ratio of force and area, okay? So that, that's neat, right? That means you get, a, you get a multiplier. You'll see the equation in just a moment. Um, it's, it was actually bundled with the other equations, but I've not called attention to it yet, okay? So the idea here is what happens inside a fluid, this is setting the stage, when pressure is exerted on it, right? So if I'm gonna put a 50 kilogram weight on a movable piston, like think like something rubber here that is free to move, right? And so when, and, but this is you know, being held here because of pressure, there's some you know, amount of trapped gas. But when I push on it, right, I can change its volume, I can increase its density, but then how does, what happens, right? Well, that's gonna cause the pressure to push back but unlike the normal force where I push on the solid unmovable ground and the ground pushes back, this fluid trapped here in this chamber is very much movable, which means that it ends up delivering the force in all directions, which just means that the pressure points in all directions, okay? So it transmits the force to the walls and the bottom of the container all equally. Now, if it's a big enough container where there's a noticeable difference in depth, then we can have, we can have a change because of that depth. But if this chamber is anywhere on a scale of just, you know, smaller than three feet or something, then um, smaller than a meter, then we would never have to worry about depth, okay? So fluid pu pushes outward uniformly in all directions when it's compressed, okay? Doesn't just push in one direction, doesn't just push back, okay? Because this whole thing, you know, the fluid is movable, okay? Any increase in pressure is transmitted uniformly throughout the fluid, Pressure exerted on a piston extends uniformly throughout the fluid, causing it to push outward from equal force per unit area on the walls and the bottom, okay? Pushes that everywhere, equal amount. Just, it's just delivered perfectly through the fluid. Is that an idealization? Sure, okay? But it's pretty reasonable that it does, that there's not like a loss of pressure, okay? Because that, that, would, that would mean that it had to be like heating up, honestly, because the energy would have to go somewhere because of the work being done. And well, there's not much, a lot of that going on, right? In most, in most fluids, okay, there's some special exceptions. Um, this is the basis of Pascal's principle. Pascal's principle is the named principle. Pascal, because that's a fluid, someone who's famous for fluids, a scientist who's famous for fluids. And 
it's a Pascal's principle, very much like we had, you know, like, you know, work energy principles or something. Principle is a term that's used interchangeably, excuse me, with law. Principle, law, same thing, okay? Any change in the pressure of a fluid is transmitted uniformly in all directions throughout the fluid. That's the actual statement of the law. Okay, so why do we care? Because this is, this is how people build hydraulic devices, like, the, like ones to lift a car. That's not included in the slides, but there's a picture in your textbook. Right, of lift, lifting up a car with, pass, with uh, Pascal's principle, you know, using using that principle, you know, applying it, applying it to something useful. Hydraulics. Um, you think of uh, you know big um, tractors um, and you know um, you know construction devices. They're you know big cranes and so on. They're often employing Pascal's principle. All right. So um, I realize I'm at a point, I'm gonna put it right in here. You've seen that word fluid over and over again, fluid, fluid, fluid. I do really want to define it right now, okay? A fluid is just not a solid. So here, let's put it down right over here. And let me, <laughs> technical problems, interesting, okay. So, all right, so we'll flip over to another page and I just wanna put down an important definition right here. Definition of fluid. Put in the comment for this video as well. This is such an important building block idea. Is a fluid is not a solid, which is uh, not the actual technical definition you would look up, um, you know, in your textbook or Wikipedia. But I think it's a helpful one. Okay, a fluid is everything that's not a solid. So a gas and a liquid are both fluids. Okay? What's interesting about that is there are particular laws that only apply to gases because gases have a defining characteristic that they don't have a defined, like using you know, a defining characteristic, they have an important thing that you need to remember about them, and that's that they don't have a defined volume. They'll fill whatever volume you let them, right? Um, so you'll just keep expanding and becoming less dense, okay? So they, liquids absolutely don't do that. They have a defined volume, but they don't have a defined shape, okay? Gases have neither a defined shape nor a defined volume. So, you know, as a kind of like a general statement, um, non, pretty non-technical, that's a great way to think about them. Collectively, though, they behave as a fluid, gases and liquids, okay? Excuse me if I said fluid instead of liquid. So liquids have a, have a defined volume. They don't have a defined shape. Gases have neither a defined volume nor a defined shape, okay? Liquid, okay, gas. Water, right, liquid water, okay, water. Um, you know, gas, water vapor, you know, um, you know, oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, okay? So that's the key difference, you know, between gases and, and liquids, but collectively they're fluids. So if we talk about fluid motion or we talk about Pascal's principle requiring force in a fluid, well, it could be either. Okay, and it may be a gas, it may be a liquid, and both are employed in actual practical engineering. Okay, so collectively, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so sorry if I gave away the answer in the upcoming question. Hopefully, you weren't looking. How does a hydro hydraulic jack work? Okay, so a force is applied to a piston. So here's the incoming force that has a small area. Okay, and it can produce a large increase in pressure. Right? Why is that? Well, think what, think what pressure is. Pressure is force per area. So your force doesn't have to be that big if your area is also small. So the smaller the area, the, big, the better, because then you're gonna get a big pressure, just like the woman that, that was delivering six million pascals of pressure to the ground as compared to the 60,000 pascals of pressure from the flat shoes, okay? So small area, high pressure for a particular force. Great, okay? So this increase in pressure is then transmitted uniformly, no loss, through the piston to the other end. So you have what a closed fluid here, all these hydraulic systems have some confined fluid, and you've got another movable piston over here. Now, since nothing else was movable, we only care about the force over here on this uh, movable piston with its particular different area from the, in, from the input piston, okay? No other areas are calculated or relevant, no other forces are relevant because everything else is rigid, unmovable, okay? So this piston that we want to move, it's going to move, it's going to push up, right? Probably to lift something like the car, okay? And think about it, it's going to have the same pressure, right? But if it has a much bigger area, then it must also have a much bigger force because the thing that's being held constant is the ratio, F over A, right? Force per area. 
And here we've calculated, if you take f over a, so I think like f1 over a1, and then you take f2 over a2, well, you can then rearrange it into this formula here that shows that the, the ratio of the forces, f2 over a1, is simply equal to the ratio over the areas. So that means, right, the bigger relative size of the output piston, well, you know, compared to the input, the bigger relative force you get. You have a force multiplier linear, just like, you know, it's just direct multiplication, just like we saw with the lever, okay? But we're not doing it with torque, we're, not, we're building it differently, and we're using fluids, not solids, okay? All right, so there is our um, application of what a hydraulic jack is, employs Pascal's principle. Let's do a quick calculation. So a force of 10 newtons is applied to a circular piston with an area of two square centimeters in a hydraulic jack. The output piston for the jack has an area of 100 square centimeters. What is the pressure in the fluid, okay? And then we'll ask for the output force, obviously. But first, what's the pressure? This is supposed to be like your first step or just something you're expected to be able to solve for, um, okay? So what is the pressure? If you want it in Pascals, you will need to convert the area from meters to centimeters, okay? All right, make sure you can do this one. There is our calculation. So here's the conversion, converting from square centimeters over to square meters. When you do that, you have to remember that you're not dividing by 100 anymore um, because it, you know, the difference was 100 centimeters per meter. Now it's 100 squared, okay? Um, so you th so I, I, that's what I was thinking about a minute ago, if you remember in the video. So when you actually do that conversion, it, you need 100 squared, which is 10,000. So the difference is 10,000 or moving the decimal place four places, which is we've done here, There, the conversion, all right, from square centimeters to square meters. Then to actually calculate the pressure, plug in the force, already in newtons, divide by that small cross-sectional area, and get your pressure value, shown here, newtons per square meter, which we know is equivalent to pascals, of 50,000, which we can rewrite as 50 kilopascals, or kPa, because k denotes 1,000. Okay, so 50,000 pascals. All right, so what's the force on the output piston? We've got the input, input force, okay, that we knew to be a measly 10 newtons. Okay, just a little push. And we realized that that achieved 50,000, um, you know, uh, pascals of pressure, so significant amount of pressure. So what are we gonna get on the output, for, on the output force, the useful force in, with this machine if it's 100 centimeters, all right? Well, run the numbers. What do you get for your output force? And by the way, if you skip the step of actually finding the pressure inside of the system and are only interested in the input and output force, you can avoid converting from square centimeters to square meters because you just are interested in the ratio and the, and the actual units will cancel. And what I'm referring to is the formula over here that F2 over F1 equals A2 over A1. The A2 and A1 can be left in whatever units they're in, you know, square nanometers for that matter, not that you'd see that, because those units will cancel if you are solving for a force. You just have to make sure that both your forces are in Newtons if you want your final value to be in Newtons, okay? Just a common case. All right, well, in this case, so we were asked for it, so maybe you have that value handy. What is the answer? Let's see, all right, so. Uh, you know, we were stick with converting, so we're going to use our value of P, feed it forward to the next step to say that F2 equals P over A2 it, times A2. Again, you could solve directly with this formula, okay? And 50,000 newtons per square meter times that 0 0.01 square meters is 500 newtons, all right? So what was our mechanical advantage? The mechanical advantage is just the product of the, you know, the multiplier of how much more force we got. Well, it was 50. Why was it 50? Because we put in 10 and we got 500 out. That is a product of 50, okay? 50 times more force. Okay, all right. So I mentioned atmospheric pressure. Let's talk a little bit more about it. So living on the surface of the earth, we're at the bottom of a sea of air, you know, really, right? It is, we are in a high pressure environment. We just don't think about it because this is where we have evolved to live, okay? The sea of air is thinner at high altitudes. Um, that's uh, a key difference, I suppose, unlike animals that live at the bottom of the sea, the actual sea, right? The sea of water. Um, well, because water doesn't actually vary much at all in terms of its density with depth. That's because it's, it's a liquid and it's essentially incompressible. That's, it. that's that term for the, the fact that liquids have a defined volume, gases don't have a defined volume, that the term for that is compressibility, okay? Gases are quite compressible, liquids are not compressible. They're both fluids because they're not solids, but that compressibility to separate the two, okay? So we end up with this atmosphere that varies significantly in density, 
you know? Um, that means actually calculating it requires um, its height, for example, it requires significantly more math than if we we're just inter interested in, you know, say, uh, knowing the pressure at the bottom of the ocean and calculating the height of the ocean by knowing the density of water because that stays a constant. The density of water is just a number, 1,000 kilograms per square uh, cubic meter. 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter is the density of water. Well, if you look at the density of air, you might find one kilogram per cubic meter, which is pretty nice because it's literally, you know, one's about 1,000, one's about one, right? Nice numbers, they work out really well. That water is 1,000 times denser than air. But that number makes an assumption. It's the number that you would typically use, which is air at or near, near sea level, you know, uh, without, you know, some particular change in, in you know, um, atmospheric pressure due to a storm and, you know, assuming, you know, other things as well, right? And then, you know, like I said, mo uh, most matters is elevation. Because if you were to look at, you know, the density of air at, say, cruising altitude of an airplane, it's a lot less than one because it significantly varies, okay, in a non-linear way. In fact, it exponentially decays, at least the pressure does, as you get up into thinner and thinner, thinner atmosphere because there's less atmosphere to push down on the layers below, causing the compressible gas to layer up in a way that a liquid doesn't, okay? The overall result, called atmospheric pressure, gives us a value of about 100,000 pascals, you know, or 101 is the number that I will regularly use. Round into 100, 100 is fine. So 100 kilopascals or 100,000 pascals, okay? Um, in the um, kind of American imperial system, it's 14.7 pounds per square inch. It's also um, 790 millimeters of mercury, which refers to building a barometer with mercury, which is a force balance um, mechanism, okay? So different, different ways to express the units. We'll also, we talk about it as being one bar, which is just atmospheric pressure, or even in physics, one ATM for one atmospheric pressure. So a lot of different ways to express the same thing. But if we're sticking with the base unit, which is always the best choice, it's just 101,000 pascals, okay? Here's that barometer. So um, Torricelli invented this barometer, which is this device that could balance out a column of water with the column of air that we all live at the bottom of, okay? So, you know, it's been hundreds of years for people that have been appreciating this amazing idea that we actually live at the bottom of an ocean of air, okay? So it turns out that, that swimming down 32 feet into water, okay, is equivalent to living at the bottom of the ocean of air. It, they're equal amounts of pressure, which does make you appreciate the fact that we are fine-tuned as a biological organism to, to live at this particular pressure of one atmosphere, because if you swim 32 feet down into you know, water, your ears are in bad shape, right? That's really deep, right? That's difficult for people to do, right? Swimming down 32 feet, like three, three times deeper than a deep swimming pool. So, but that's just an increase of one atmosphere. That's just doubling our, our, you know, that, the atmosphere just doubling, doubling is a big deal, I suppose. But regardless, that's the idea, that's the equivalent amount of water it takes to get the atmosphere. It also goes to show you how much denser water is, and it does only take 32 feet, about 10 meters, to you know, be equivalent to about 100, kilometer, 100 kilometers, you know, 60 to 100, depending, because it gets really thin at the top, um, of atmosphere, okay? So, that's cool, but that wouldn't be practical to build a barometer out of water, right? Despite that really neat um, equivalence of pressure. So instead, you use excuse me, um, a much denser fluid. The densest fluid that exists is that is mercury, okay? And so um, the idea is if you inverted it in an a open container, because it, ha it has to be open here, because if you seal this off, then the atmosphere is not going to push. You sealed it from the atmosphere, okay? They, it can't you know, deliver the force through the sealed glass. You could have it, you know, kind of um, mostly closed. It's just little holes, just somehow to allow the atmospheric pressure to kind of normalize out and push on it, okay? And because the mercury is much denser, right, it has a density that is you know, many times greater, you only end up with, you only need 760 millimeters, okay, which is 76 centimeters. For some, for some reason, it's always expressed in millimeters for this particular measurement, this particular barometer idea, right, with mercury. But 760 millimeters to be equivalent to the entire atmosphere, right, because at a depth of just 76 centimeters in mercury, you've gone up to the same pressure from 32 feet of water, you know, 101,000 pascals. Just goes to show you how dense mercury is. No one's gonna go swimming in mercury though, especially because it's so toxic, but you would definitely also get crushed by it, okay? So air pressure acting on the mercury in the dish, um, supporting a column mercury of height proportional to the atmospheric pressure, okay? Mercury is very dense, it's a metal after all, right? Very strange metal, okay? So um, a famous experiment um, back in the um, 1600s by Otto von Guericke 
um, demonstrated this idea by taking two hemispheres, so imagine like a big ball, but a metal ball, um, using a pump, right, like as a rudimentary um, pump, to, you know, connect hoses and pump the air out of both those hemispheres when they're, you know, kind of like, like locked into each other. Not in the way where they, they can't just pop apart, but just sort of like pushed up against each other. So you pump the air out of both hats, okay? Well, when you do that, what are you creating inside of this now complete sphere? Because you, you know, we push the two sides of the hemisphere together. What you've produced is a vacuum, a spherical vacuum surrounded by the sea of air, the atmosphere that we live at the bottom of, right? If we're at or near sea level. Well, that means there's a lot of force now, right? Because this is a big metal sphere, okay? And so you then we're going to have a force which is going to be maybe you know over over a square you know a square meter. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands of newtons pushing it together, okay? Two eight-horse teams were unable to pull them apart, okay? Because what we're seeing is the actual manifestation of how big that force is compared to a vacuum, all right? So again, that's why you know the unfortunate human doubles or triples in volume when you put them out in, into a vacuum, because it's very different from the high-pressure environment that we live in, okay? And so, right, couldn't pull them apart because the force from the outside was pushing in. Get it, right? Because there, there's a vacuum inside that sphere now because, because they pumped out all the air. And so now there's a huge amount of force just pushing in thanks to the atmosphere. And you, can, you have to overcome that if you actually want to pull them apart. Now, there is a great way to pull them apart. Just open a little latch, right? Or poke a hole, right? You don't, because I mean, when you tie the horses together, you're trying to literally just like pull them exactly the opposite way, right? Which does exactly require overcoming the force of the atmosphere. But if you just poke a hole in the, then the atmosphere, like a fluid that it is, will just rush in, okay? No force there. It wants to rush in, okay? But it doesn't want to, you know, but it also wants to keep it, you know, close in on it. That's the whole point. It wants to close in. It wants to crush this vacuum, okay? But we, instead, we're trying to open it in the case of, with the two eight-horse teams. There's a great woodcut I've seen in other, other textbooks. Woodcutting, like an old-fashioned uh, sketch of it. So in other experiments on variations in atmospheric pressure, Pascal sent his brother-in-law to the top of a mountain with a barometer, so think that mercury device, and a partially inflated balloon. The balloon expanded as the climbers gained elevation. This is evidence of a decrease in the external atmospheric pressure, okay? What would happen if the barometer, okay? Because the balloon expands, what happens to the barometer? It spills, okay? Because it still has the same weight because you, you haven't significantly affected gravity. Gravity does change of distance, but much more slowly, also over hundreds of kilometers rather than just, you know, hundreds of meters of elevation. But atmospheric pressure does change over hundreds of meters, especially thousands of meters of elevation. And what happens then is there's gonna be a totally appreciable change in the atmospheric pressure, no change in the weight of the mercury, then, you know, if you think about it, which, which is going to be bigger? Because here there is a force balance. There is a force balance right here, okay, between the pressure pushing on the mercury and the weight of the mercury pushing back up, the weight of the entire column, because that, that weight wants to come down, get delivered, right, through the mercury as a pressure, then, you know, manifests as a force at the surface where there's an ability to move, right? So that if there's a force pushing up that's greater than the force pushing in, then the mercury will continue to push right up and spill over the edge, okay? So that's what will happen to the barometer if we take it up to high elevation. There's actual kind of picture of that. We saw, I saw it before in the textbook. I was previewing it, showing the idea of living at a column of, at the bottom of a column of compressible fluid known as a gas. The gas, the gas that we all live in, mostly nitrogen, Pressure's 20% of oxygen, byproduct of plants that we all breathe, okay? So this idea then of, uh, about gas leads us to Boyle's law, last topic here. And Boyle's law is interesting because it, it starts getting into some other laws of gases like the ideal gas law, but it predates them and it's, it's, a, it's more basic. It, it doesn't take into account as many considerations, but it works pretty well for a gas, Spe really specifically the atmosphere because it needs to be a gas that is just going to get you know, that's just going to have get compressed because, you know, you know, you can go deeper into it and then and you can then change the volume. I guess the, the other way it works is a confined gas, like a balloon, right? So the, the balloon and the atmosphere are behaving exactly the same in a sense because you can have a, the pressure exerted on the balloon uh, is greater and the volume of the balloon is smaller. And then if you make the pressure um, smaller, then the volume will get bigger because, it's, because the product remains constant. The product of pressure and volume doesn't change, okay? All right? 
So um, a fixed quantity of gas is held in the cylinder capped at one end by a movable piston. The pressure of the gas is initially one atmosphere, 101, there's 101, right, that's the number I use, 101,000 pascals. And the volume is initially 0.3 cubic meters, no conversion needed. What is the final volume of the gas if the pressure is increased to three atmospheres at constant temperature? That's appreciating uh, the constant temperature bit, don't worry about it. Notice the temperature does not show up in Boyle's law. It's behind the scenes. It, it will always be constant, okay? So we're gonna use this law here, all right? Keep rem remembering that the product of pressure and volume doesn't change, okay? And fun fact, the units of this, pressure and volume, well, pressure is, new uh, is newtons per square meter, volume is cubic meters, so you end up with newton meters, that's work, okay? So saying that the product of pressure and volume is the same is none other than conservation of work, okay? It is really, 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 um, it's, it's just a conservation of energy, the idea that the, that the work is, is the same thing, all right? So here, let's go. I wanna write this down for you as another important concept, okay? The last, last one here in this video, but pressure multiplied by volume has units of newtons per square meter multiplied by cubic meters, which is then just going to be newton meters because the square meters cancel, leaving just a meter in the numerator. Newton meters, that's work, which is also joules, okay? So we see that pressure times volume is work and is conserved, okay? All right, measured in joules. Newton meters, joules, same thing. It's an energy. So this idea of saying that PV remains constant is part and parcel of conservation of energy. It's just conservation of energy tweaked a certain way, applied to fluids, and also applied to heat, because the ideal gas law comes up very important. It's gonna be, you wanna see it with heat, right? So Boyle's law we're seeing is the fluid law here, but it's also a heat law, okay? Right, because they're very similar ideas. Good, so hopefully hopefully that kind of, you know, makes it seem justified, justifiable, and explain you know, what, where it's coming from. All right, so let's get back to this. You ready for the calculation? Bet you are. Make sure, make sure you're able to do it. Pause if you need to. All right, there it is, okay. We're going to set it up. Our one unknown is V2, okay? So then we solve for V2. It's simply a matter of dividing both sides by P2, which you see is shown here. Then plug our numbers, one ATM, okay, and three ATM. Notice I didn't even bother to convert these over, they didn't, to um, kilopascals or anything. That's because since the ratio, whatever units they have will cancel. So you might as well leave them in the most convenient, okay? Just make sure they're the same. Now, do pay attention to the units of the volume because that unit will carry over, it won't cancel, and it matters for your final answer. But since it was already cubic meters, and we, that's what we'll want for our final answer, there we go, we just get one over three times 0.3, which is just 0.1. There you go, 0.1 cubic meter. You tripled the atmospheric pressure, and you ended up with exactly one third the volume. That's what you'd expect from such a simple linear formula. P1V1 equals P2V2, okay, Boyle's Law. All right. So that wraps up this first lecture. We'll continue with fluids at rest very briefly in the next lecture where we'll talk about Archimedes' principle and the, the concept of buoyancy, making things float. It's pretty cool, okay? You can build a boat out of concrete thanks to buoyancy. Um, neat concept, hopefully uh, we'll drive that one home. Um, but we won't spend too long on it because then we'll move right on in terms of number of slides to talking about fluids in motion and we'll talk about the continuity formula and even Bernoulli's formula, which is one of my favorites. So looking forward to that, and that, that should be the second video um, and final video for chapter nine from, forgot to say it, but um, from Physics of Everyday Phenomenon, Griffith, 10th edition. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this video has been interesting and informative.